Today we'll be talking about plasma DNA purification and quantitation. By the end of this video, you should be able to list the main steps of plasmid isolation and purification using alkaline lysis and silica absorption respectively, describe the importance of each step, use a micropipette to deliver a specific volume, evaluate the purity of your DNA sample, and calculate DNA concentrations. The goal of our experiment is to end up with purified plasmid DNA. In order to do that, we're going to have to isolate the plasmid from the bacterial cell where it was made and all of the components like proteins, genomic DNA, and the lipids that make up the cell. We'll start our experiment with an overnight culture of bacteria, which will centrifuge to form a bacterial cell pellet. We'll remove the culture media, and then we're going to resuspend the bacterial cell pellet by repeatedly pipetting up and down. We want to make sure that we completely resuspend the pellet, otherwise we'll have inefficient lysis and a drastic reduction in the amount of plasma DNA recovered. Next, we will add our lysis buffer. If we're using a color indicator, we'll see that the solution will turn blue. We want to rock the tube until it's completely blue, which will indicate that we've lysed all the bacterial cells. We're using an alkaline lysis buffer, so that's going to raise the pH inside the tube. The lysis buffer also contains a detergent, SDS, and together, this will have several effects. First, it's going to lyse the bacterial cell which is going to release all of the cellular components. The high pH is also going to cause our DNA strands to separate and no longer base pair. It's important to remember that DNA strands will be, still be physically associated with each other even though they are not base paired. That's true for both our plasma DNA and our genomic DNA. Additionally, the high pH is going to cause our proteins to denature and unfold. In our next step, we're going to neutralize the pH with a weak acid now that the pH is neutral again, we're going to see a couple things happen. First, our DNA strands are going to base pair again. In the case of plasmids, which are relatively small, this can happen efficiently in a short period of time. In contrast, genomic DNA is not going to be able to efficiently base pair. As a result, the gene genomic DNA, proteins, and lipids will all aggregate into a fluffy white precipitate, which you will be able to see in the now colorless solution in your tube. The aggregated material is insoluble, which allows us to separate from the soluble plasmid DNA by centrifugation. We have now isolated our plasmid DNA, but we still have some contaminants, as well as a lot of different ions that came along with our different buffers. So before we can use our plasmid DNA, we want to remove all of these contaminants. We'll be doing that with a spin column that has a silica matrix. Under high ionic strength, the silica will selectively bind to DNA. Once the DNA is bound, we can wash the column until we have removed all of our contaminants. Once we're ready to elute, we will switch to a buffer that has a low ionic strength. Under these conditions, the DNA will release from the silica matrix and will end up with our purified plasmid DNA. So now that we have our purified plasmid DNA, we want to know two things about it. We want to know the purity and concentration of the DNA. Both of these questions can be answered with a spectrophotometer. In our case, we'll be using a nanodrop spectrophotometer, which has the advantage of only needing small volumes of sample. Since we're using small sample volumes, we need to make sure that we pipette accurately. To do that, we'll first need to select which micropipette to use. Shown here are four different micropipettes. They are referred to as P and the maximum volume they can accurately pipette. For example, a P200 micropipette can pipette a maximum of 200 microliters. When selecting which micropipette we should use, always use the micropipette with the smallest volume range that is appropriate for your desired volume. For instance, a P10 and a P20 could both be used to pipette 5 microliters, but a P10 is the better choice since it will pipette the smaller volume more accurately. If we wanted to pipette 100 microliters, which pipette would we choose? While a P1000 could be used to pipette 100 microliters, the best choice would be a P200. Once we've selected our micropipette and are ready to pipette, we want to start by pushing the plunger down to the first stop position. You'll know you're there when you feel pressure. Now with the plunger depressed, you can put your tip into your liquid. You want to stay near the top of the liquid because if you go too far down, you can end up with liquid stuck to the side of your tip, which is going to affect the accuracy of your pipetting. Once you have placed the tip, you can slowly release the pressure on your plunger, which is going to pull liquid into your tip, 
When you are ready to dispense, you will place your tip on the sidewall of your new tube. You will push down to the first stop again, and then push even further to what's called the second stop. That's going to make sure that you've removed all the liquid from your tip. After pipetting something especially viscous, you might want to again release the plunger and pull liquid back up and press to the second stop again to really rinse your tip. The Nano Drop has a little pedestal, shown here zoomed in, and we want to make sure that when we pipette we end up with our liquid on top of this pedestal. We will then bring the arm of the instrument down, press down, and then release. When we're done, we should have a column of liquid formed. Before you measure your sample, you want to make sure that you have this liquid column formed, otherwise you will have an inaccurate reading. The software will generate an absorbance spectrum after measuring our sample. Shown here is a spectrum that represents the absorbance of pure RNA, DNA, and protein. We can see in pink the DNA and in green the RNA have a maximum absorbance at 260 nanometers. In contrast, protein absorbs maximally at 280 nanometers. To assess the purity of our samples, we divide the absorbance at 260 by the absorbance at 280. For pure DNA, we would expect a ratio of 1.8. For RNA, we would have a ratio of 2, and with protein, we'd have a ratio of 0.8. For DNA purification, the most common reason for a deviation from the ideal ratio is due to chemical contaminants, which will give a lower ratio. We can also use the absorbance at 260 to determine the concentration of our plasma DNA. One unit of, of absorbance at 260 corresponds to 50 micrograms per milliliter of DNA. This constant has been determined empirically to be true for all double-stranded DNA. If our plasma DNA is very concentrated, we may want to dilute it to get an accurate reading. The dilution factor is calculated by dividing our final volume by our initial volume. For example, if you had 10 microliters of a DNA solution and you added 90 microliters of water to it, you would have a final volume of 100 microliters. Since the volume of our DNA solution has increased, the concentration of our DNA has decreased. By dividing the final volume by the initial volume, we get a dilution factor of 10, meaning that our DNA concentration is now tenfold lower than when we started. So to determine our concentration, we take the absorbance at 260, we multiply it by 50, and then multiply it by our dilution factor to end up with the final concentration of our DNA. So by measuring the absorbance of our sample at 260 and 280, we can get both the concentration and the purity of our sample. Now at the end of this video, you should be able to list the main steps of plasmid isolation and purification, describe the importance of each step, use a micropipette to deliver a specific volume, evaluate the purity of your DNA sample, and calculate DNA concentrations. Thanks for listening.